Homeostasis is the term given to an organism's ability to regulate internal conditions even when external conditions change. This is important so crucial chemical reactions involving enzymes can happen at an optimum rate. Amongst other things, our bodies work hard to regulate blood glucose concentration, temperature and water levels. One way that our body achieves this is with our nervous system. It consists of the CNS, the central nervous system, which includes the brain and spinal cord, and the PNS, the peripheral nervous system, the nerves that go through the rest of the body. A receptor, for example, in your skin, detects a change due to a stimulus, like a hot hob. An electrical signal travels to the spine through sensory and relay neurons, as nerve cells. The signal travels across the gap between these neurons, called the synapse, by a neurotransmitter chemical. Once at the spine, the signal can go to the brain, where you can make the conscious decision to act. The signal then goes back to an effector, like the muscle in your arm, via relay and motor neurons, so that you move your arm. A reflex is when the signal bypasses the brain and goes straight through the spine to the effector. This is a reflex arc. This, of course, is much faster than you making a conscious decision. Glands can also be effectors, which produce specific chemicals your body needs. For example, your salivary glands in your mouth make saliva when you eat food. You can investigate reaction times by holding the bottom of a ruler between a person's finger and thumb and dropping it without warning. Then you can measure the distance it falls before they catch it. Do this multiple times and take the mean average. Not too many times though, as their nervous systems will start to get a bit better at reacting to this. You can introduce an independent variable, like a stimulant, for example, coffee or a sugary drink, or a depressant, which will have the opposite effect, although I can't really think of any that are legal for you guys at the minute. Then you can see how they decrease or increase reaction time respectively. You could calculate the reaction time from the distance using S equals half 80 squared, but you'll never be expected to do that in a paper. But it is something you could mention if you are asked a six marker on this, maybe. These are the parts of the brain you need to know. The cerebral cortex is responsible for higher level functions like memory, speech and problem solving. The cerebellum is responsible for your motor skills, movement, balance and coordination. The medulla oblongata controls unconscious actions your body takes. You don't think about them, like your heart beating or breathing. It's also what controls the release of adrenaline. MRI scans, that's magnetic resonance imaging, are a way of seeing the activity in your brain safely. If something goes wrong with your brain though, it can be very difficult to treat without damaging important parts of it. Your eyes are the most genius cameras ever made. Accommodation is the term given to the eye's ability to change the shape of the lens in order to focus light that comes from objects that are different distances away on the retina. To focus light that comes from objects far away, the ciliary muscles relax and the suspensory ligaments tighten. They're both connected to the lens. This results in the lens becoming thinner, and that means the light is only refracted a little bit, and that focuses the light on the retina. To focus on near objects, the opposite is true. The ciliary muscles contract, the suspensory ligaments slacken, and the lens becomes fatter or thicker. That means it becomes more powerful, so light is refracted more, which means that the light coming from the object still converges, that means meets, focuses on the retina, so you see a clear image. The pupil, the hole in the iris, can change size depending on the light intensity hitting the eye. The cornea is the transparent outer layer where light enters the eye. It has a slight lensing effect itself, while the white surface that covers the rest of the eye is called the sclera. The light is focused on the retina at the back of the eye, which consists of cells that respond to light. Some of these cells only detect light intensity, not color. These are called rods, while there are three different types of cones which detect green, blue or red wavelengths of light, a mix of which will produce the colors we then perceive when the signal reaches our brain via the optic nerve. Myopia is the medical term for short-sightedness. You can't focus on far objects. Hyperopia is long-sightedness, the opposite. Glasses or contact lenses are usually used to mitigate this by slightly converging or diverging the light before it enters the eye. Laser eye surgery changes the shape of the cornea to achieve the same effect. Thermoregulation is your body controlling its internal temperature by the brain sensing blood temperature, then sending nervous and hormonal signals to various effectors around your body in order that your body loses heat to its surroundings more slowly or quickly. For example, if you're too hot, sweat glands in your skin cause water to cover the surface. It evaporates, taking heat away from your body quickly. 
Blood vessels also dilate, widen, to increase blood flow to the skin to increase the rate of heat loss. We call this vasodilation. If you're too cold, we have vasoconstriction instead, hence you go pale. You also shiver, which causes your muscles to produce more heat. The endocrine system is a system of glands that produce or secrete hormones that travel to affect us via the blood. This is, of course, slower than any signal carried by the nervous system. The pituitary gland in your brain can be considered the main or master gland as it produces hormones in response to stimuli that travel to other glands in your body in order to make them start producing certain chemicals. Examples are the pancreas, which produces insulin, the thyroid, which controls all sorts of things like growth and heart, muscle and digestive function, and more, the adrenal glands, which produce adrenaline, and the ovaries or testes, which release eggs or sperm, depending on which you have. Speaking of the pancreas then, it's involved in making sure your blood glucose levels aren't too high or low. If they're too high, the pancreas secretes insulin, which causes glucose to move from the blood into your cells to be used for respiration. Any excess glucose can be converted into glycogen to store energy, and that's done by the liver. If these levels are too low, on the other hand, the pancreas produces another hormone called glucagon, which causes the liver and muscles to turn glycogen back into glucose, ready to be used. Type 1 diabetes is what you have when your pancreas can't produce enough insulin and you have to take insulin injections to do the job instead. Type 2 is when your cells no longer absorb the glucose as they should, so you have to be careful with your diet and if you're overweight or obese, you have a much higher risk of developing this. Your body loses water when you exhale, sweat or urinate. If your body has too much water, let's say for example you drink too much, your kidneys remove it from your blood at a faster rate, where it's mixed with urea to become urine. Urea contains ammonia, which is produced from excess proteins broken down into amino acids by the liver. Kidneys do a good job of keeping the water balance just right. They also filter your blood to reabsorb useful substances like glucose and some ions. A bit more detail about how they work then. Antidiuretic hormone, or ADH, is produced in the pituitary gland, which travels to the kidneys and causes the tubules in your kidney to reabsorb more water into the bloodstream, so less then goes to the bladder. If the water level is too high, less ADH is produced, so the kidneys cause more water to be lost in urine. In both cases, the water level returns to normal, so this is an example of negative feedback. Negative feedback might sound like it's a bad thing, but all it means is that the body responds in such a way as to return things to normal. If your kidneys aren't working properly, dialysis is required. Essentially, your blood is sent through a machine that does the same job as your kidneys. If this doesn't happen, the buildup of urea can poison you. Menstruation occurs in females after puberty. First, FSH, made by the pituitary gland, causes an egg to mature in the ovary. This also causes the ovaries to produce estrogen, which causes the uterus lining to thicken. It also inhibits or stops the production of FSH, so no more eggs mature in that cycle. Very clever. Estrogen also causes the pituitary gland to produce LH, luteinizing hormone, which causes the egg to be released, and it starts to travel towards the uterus via the oviduct over several days. Finally, progesterone is also produced by the ovaries, which maintains the uterus lining. This is great news if you're looking to get pregnant. If not, you need to find some way of stopping a sperm cell from meeting an egg cell. Contraception options include pills that inhibit FSH production, so no eggs mature, progesterone injections that stop any eggs from being released, or you can just have an implant that slowly releases this over months or years if needed. Condoms for men and diaphragms for women are simple barriers to stop sperm from reaching an egg. An IUD, an intrauterine device like a copper coil, prevents a fertilized egg from implanting in the lining. You could quite simply just avoid sex for some time after the egg has been released, as that's when it travels slowly down the oviduct where a sperm can meet it. Clamping the oviducts, sometimes referred to as having your tubes tied, or cutting the sperm ducts, either of these will obviously stop the cells from meeting. Some couples, however, would love to have children but can't due to infertility. Sometimes it's something fairly simple, like not enough FSH or LH produced, which injections can fix. The most expensive solution to bigger issues is IVF, in vitro fertilization. Eggs are harvested from the woman after inducing their release and will then be fertilized in the lab with the prospective father's sperm. Any embryos that develop are inserted back into the uterus, where they will hopefully embed in the lining and grow normally. The success rate, sadly, is very low, but there's also the risk that there could be more than one baby born, which might not be desirable.
If an egg is successfully fertilized, it will embed itself in the uterus lining where it will divide to form a zygote and then an embryo. The umbilical cord develops between it and the uterus lining, which has a good blood supply to provide oxygen, nutrients and everything else the baby needs to grow. Even in the womb, the higher levels of testosterone in a male or estrogen in a female determines the baby's physiology. Adrenaline is the hormone that increases heart and breathing rate in stressful situations to prepare the body for fight or flight. Thyroxin is secreted by the thyroid. This controls metabolic rate. Plants also have their own hormones, which we can utilize when growing them. Gibberellins cause seed germination to occur, which we can add to seeds to give them a wake-up call. It also promotes flowering and increases the size of fruits. Ethene induces ripening of fruits. Auxins control shoot and root growth. It's destroyed by sunlight, so it gathers on the shaded side of a shoot, causing an unequal distribution, causing more growth and elongation of cells on the shaded side, so the shoot bends toward the sun or light source. This is what we call phototropism. In roots, however, auxins inhibit growth. The hormone gathers on the bottom of a root. That means the top side grows more quickly, causing the root to grow downwards. This is called geotropism. We can also use auxins as weed killers, rooting powders, and for promoting growth in tissue cultures. We can do a mini investigation. We can put some seeds on damp cotton wool in a Petri dish, for example, stand the Petri dish on its side, leave it for a few days, then turn it 90 degrees, and you should see that the roots have bent in that time, demonstrating geotropism in roots. So I hope you found that helpful. Leave a like and a comment if you did. And click on the card to take you to the playlist for all of the papers. And don't forget to check out the Science Shorts app to help you test your knowledge.